Thank you so much. And I really, like all the other speakers here today, I, I very much appreciate this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of the audience and hear the other speakers. Uh, I don't know if the uh, organizers intended to the order of this particular session, but you probably couldn't have placed me after a better talk than the one I just followed. <laughs> Uh, because uh, the, uh, the punchline to the end of this story, and we'll give it to you early, is that the trip to Mars is going to depend upon six inches of topsoil <laughs> and the fact that it rains. Uh, so indeed, what I want to talk about is, is how, what does food have to do about the mission to Mars and how that's going to be so much different from what we've been doing in our space exploration up to this date. I will tell you that as I have had a chance to work on this project and we've gathered as a group to talk about it, we always are laughing. It is hilarious as we try to decide how we're going to put technology into the situations that uh, these astronauts will, uh, of microgravity and in, in enclosed spaces. But one of the things that they were very, um, as we spoke with astronauts, they to told us every time was how important food was. And one of the things they also talked about, and I'm going to uh, digress from my talk just a little bit, is the sense of community. And the sense of community has been something that everybody at Virginia Tech has been very aware of for three weeks and one day uh, when a great tragedy came to our campus. And uh, as a result of that, we're all still very much uh, who are associated with Virginia Tech in a healing process. And part of that is the bringing together of people and the caring and the concern that's, that's come from that. And I've, I've seen some of that here, and I've had people come and speak to me about, about our tragic events on our campus. And I've also seen the power of this particular conference as speakers from various disciplines come together and say, I care about your fungus, I care about your bees, I care about your victory garden, and I care about your wine and food. And it, it really is part of the the emotional contact that we put together as people as we, as we look at uh, uh, the thing that we call our existence. And so as we talk about uh, the mission to Mars, uh, you can't, you, it, that's part of it. It really is very important to it. Well, if my daughter were here, she's 20, and she would say, Dad, you were a real goober. Now, you know, I'm not sure what a goober is, <laughs> but from the context, I'm not, I don't think it's all that good. Someone who's, someone who's 20 can probably tell me about that later. Uh, but at, at 20, where were you in July of 1969? I was, I was standing in front of some trees mugging for a camera, obviously. More hair and fewer chins at that time. Uh, but I was changed by that mission to the moon. I, I suspect those in the audience who uh, are old enough to remember that, it was exciting. It was thrilling. It, was, it, had, been a, it had been a national challenge which we accepted. Uh, it was something that we as a nation came together, and uh, I was working that night in an ice cream store, but I had uh, brought with me what amounted to a portable TV at that time and had it to where I could watch every minute, and we literally locked the doors to the store the manager wasn't around, so we got away with that. We uh, locked the doors to the store and watched as, as, as a man walked on the moon. And that was exciting. That was thrilling. So when I had the chance to uh, work on this project, I, I'd have done it for free. Absolutely. Uh, I, I find that here's today's USA Today. And I find that maybe I'm not alone. I see on today's uh, USA Today, there's a story that says, Who's paying $200,000 for a few minutes in space? And if you read today's story, it will tell you that for four to five minutes of weightlessness, you can have that for $200,000. Or for a mere 20 to 25 million, you can also go up to the International Space Station for a few days. So I, I think the romance and the, the excitement of the exploration uh, is something that many of us share. It, it's, it's important to us. So it's been important to me to be part of this. From, from that kid right there who uh, was real excited in 1969 to, to watch a man on moon, 
the thoughts of putting a, a person on, uh, on Mars has been very interesting. Well, as part of this training, as we've been going through this, it's been several years in, in the making, we had a chance to uh, meet with astronauts down at uh, Houston, and one in particular was captivating, and that was uh, Shannon Lucid, and Shannon's the American who has spent the most time in space. Among other things, she spent more than six months in, uh, on the Russian space station Mir with two cosmonauts. Now think about this for a minute. Uh, it's, it's a little bit larger than a bus, but not much. You're going to spend six months with uh, two other people sealed in this capsule. There are no showers. There is no bath. Right? There is no privacy. And every hour and a half, it's 4 a.m. <laughs> so if, if you're in that type of situation, what would your reaction be to food? If you've, now, if you've now been sealed into a capsule for six months, you know there's no, no, you're there for the duration, there's no bath, there's no privacy, and so now what's going to be your most important event of your day is going to be your food. Uh, so indeed, that was the story to us. Food was critical to the psychological welfare of the astronauts. In fact, uh, it felt, of course, I'm a food scientist, I'm a foodie. I, I, it's sort of a little surprising to me that NASA has gone as far in their development of, of, the, uh, of the rocket science and of the, of the propulsion and all the different components. And then they said, oh, yeah, we've got to have the food, right? So they went back and they said, they, they've done a lot. Is this, there's a well-developed uh, uh, technology that's going to bring many different things together. Uh, and indeed, one of the things, there'll have to be a victory garden there for them to make it to Mars and back. Uh, and they said, oh, but to do that, we're going to have to be able to handle this food. We're going to have to train them to prepare it, to process it, to grow it. And that'll have to be part of the experience. So Shannon, the one thing that she told us was, and here you see another, this isn't Shannon Lucid, but another astronaut that has in his right hand a pair of scissors. And the scissors, the only thing they used the scissors for was to open their food. So uh, they had, since it was always every hour and a half, it was 4 a.m., they, they had a chance to set when they would eat. And everybody stopped, and they shared their meals together. Very common. And then, as you will, might know, they, uh, the, the nutritionists back on Earth have planned their meals very carefully and have packaged them day by day in the right sequence for them to get the right nutrition. So obviously, the first thing they did was they traded. And they said, <laughs> here, I, the Russian soup is much preferred to the American pudding. And so they would trade their, their food back and forth, much to the great consternation of the nutritionist. <laughs> After some discussion, one of the things that we learned was that astronauts invariably lose weight during their space mission. And as, it, as that progression. They've, they've plotted it out. At that rate, that makes it mission critical for the trip to Mars. There's another astronaut with a pair of scissors in his hand. So the question is, how important? Shannon Lucid thought they were the most important thing she owned was her scissors. All right, current space food is a packed lunch. Uh, they have the ability to uh, uh, put all the provisions on, onto the spaceship that they wish. It's a mix of commercial products and things that NASA has procured from private vendors. Uh, the International Space Station, uh, the International Skylab has international food. The U.S. has a, uh, an agreement with Russia that half the food supplied there will be from Russia. So all the food was, was uh, labeled in both English and Russian. Uh, dehydrated foods were very acceptable because they were using hydrogen fuel cells. In fact, on the space shuttle and Skylab with, with fuel cells, water's in excess. So they were jettisoning water. They had plenty of water. So dehydrated foods, very uh, economical, made sense. They're, they won't have hydrogen fuel cells on the trip to Mars, so water will come in the form of the food. There won't be excess water. So water is very important to us. A picture of what uh, some space food might look like, and you see a, a metal can with a pop top. 
Uh, it shocked me as I looked at the Russian foods that were coming in. We would see flexible uh, packaging. One of our earlier speakers today pointed out that the packaging was 45% of the energy involved in the distribution of a bottle of wine. Uh, it's the same thing here. The packaging is critical to the, to the mission efficiency of the, uh, of the food in space. There's an astronaut having some fun with his M&Ms. Uh, M&Ms fly on just about every space mission. And here you see a picture of the galley in, uh, in the space shuttle where you uh, see they have some, uh, uh, the yellow packages down there are commercially purchased uh, aseptic puddings, little pudding packs, shelf-stable pudding. Uh, you might see some peanuts, some almonds, some M&Ms that have been repackaged, and dehydrated foods. So those are the types of things that uh, are currently being flown in space, uh, very similar to what you might buy at a grocery store or might buy at a camping store that's been dehydrated. That's not what will be taken to Mars. Collapsible bottles. Uh, in space, they like things that are sticky. So uh, rice that's sticky is good. Uh, different casseroles with a little cheese sauce, that's good. Uh, a crumbly biscuit would be bad. A cracker is a disaster, and they really like, like tortillas. Tortillas are the preferred bread in space. Well, can you envision a trip to Mars? Uh, NASA's working on that. Uh, it will be a, a very different uh, type of exploration than we've ever done. It'll be something where uh, we'll have to take with us the things we need. It won't, and the spaceship won't look like what we're accustomed to seeing. Right now, there's a design for a, an inflatable trailer that comes behind the spaceship that'll be the gardens that will go with the, uh, give them the opportunity to recycle the air, recycle the water, and grow some of the food that they'll need for their journey. Uh, this, uh, as I went on the website to uh, prepare this talk, it blows my mind that uh, right now you can go and you can look and from space you can see a Victoria Crater, a, a very prominent feature on the surface of, uh, of Mars. And then down below it is the, uh, the actual photograph from the, the Mars rover looking down in that crater as uh, we got a close-up picture of what Mars looks like. Another close-up picture of the Mars landscape. Uh, it doesn't look very hospitable. Uh, if you think planting over lead and, uh, and some of these other uh, things that are sort of contaminating the surface of uh, Victory Gardens in San Francisco, obviously there's more problems here. So they'll have to bring their own soil, they'll just much like what we saw in the last presentation. They'll put the kit together and they'll take it with them. So what, do, what, did they, what was the charge given to us food technologists? They said, well, you need three to five years shelf life. And right now, and that's not much different from what the military says, right now that they're, they're testing uh, food in space, they've got it in long duration tests to, to determine the effect of radiation that we know will be on that. Three to five years. The dual lander takes uh, 180 days transit each way. So that's, that's one year to get there and back, assuming you don't want to stay any time. And if you make that long a trip, you'd like to stay a little while. Uh, so they think that approximately 600 days will be a trip to Mars. And the planning, planning is for six astronauts. So uh, you can sort of imagine how much food you would like for 600 days times six, and that's the weight of the food that needs to go to Mars and back. It can't do it. There's not a, it, has to, it has to come some other way. One of the other things that they're working on is an evolved Mars base uh, where they would have an extended stay of more than 10 years. All right, so one of the premises that was given to us was that because of the distance and the logistics, resupply, much like what we do in low Earth, low Earth orbit right now, would be impossible. So we have to have some way to have extended shelf life for the foods we take and post harvest processing for foods that would be grown. So in addition to, we heard the bok choy was in excess, all right? Indeed, that's the problem. If you grow a garden, you're going to have excess of lettuce. You're going to have excess of bok choy. Bok choy isn't on the space list, but lettuce is. Tomatoes, soybeans, wheat. 
and all, all the horticulturists who've been working on this project for the last 30 years so were growing these plants in an effort to determine which ones were best to help purify the air and the water. And that's great, but eating a soybean plant isn't all that, all that much fun. Uh, you, you only want the, the beans from it, and the rest of it's a, a lot of problem. So uh, right now, they finally got people in to talk about how do we eat the whole plant, and what plant should we be growing, and what makes the most sense. Well, it had to be uh, safe and nutritious. Uh, one of the uh, first uh, giggle points on this whole discussion was we'd be like the, the Jetsons, and everybody would have a food pill. This would be the, uh, the idea would be that you would take a food pill, and that'd all be compressed, much like kibbles and bits or dog chow or something like that. And that was, uh, while that made some uh, laugh as we were going through it, it was certainly unacceptable uh, because the, the satiety, the quality of the food, was really important to the psychological benefit of the astronauts. Uh, one of our big problems is, is calcium loss. Right now, as it stands now, they, uh, they're losing ca the astronauts lose calcium in space at a rate that exceeds what a 600-day mission would permit for them to have sufficiently strong bones to return. So sodium and calcium and those balances are critical to the mission. So one of the things that we had to do was convert raw crops into edible ingredients and products, hence the project that I was working on. We looked at uh, what do you do with all that bok choy. Uh, you say, well, we, we don't need to have bok choy for three to five years, but we do need to spread it out over some period of time while we're growing that next crop of bok choy or that lettuce. And much like when you buy bagged lettuce now in your, in your uh, grocery store, uh, there'll be modified atmosphere packaging that's going to extend that shelf life to give them a chance to reuse it and give them some period of, of extended use of their products. Another thing, with, if wheat's going to come in, we, we had a, a group that was designing uh, uh, bulk storage for the, the grains and different products so we could keep them. And again, the idea that if you did grow wheat, you would have to some period to store that and then use it later in a different machine. Uh, Dr. Paul Singh at UC Davis is uh, developing a soy processor as part of this project that's going to be looking at taking soybeans and converting it into products in space. But one of the real challenges to us was they said, okay, how much power could we have for all this machinery? And they said, 60 watts. <laughs> if, uh, if any of you in the room ever had a, uh, a Mattel, what's the Mattel home bake? Uh, easy, easy bake, bake, easy bake, there you go. A 60 watt light bulb is in a Mattel easy bake oven. That's, that's the power that they said we could have. Uh, we said, how about, how about uh, solar power? in transit, and they said, you know, we want to have a little microgravity for these guys, so we're going to be rotating the, the space station, I mean, the, 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 the Mars lander. So when that's rotating, they can't use solar. So 60, 60 watts. Uh, so part of, the, part of the real problem was to do this with 60 watts. All right, so we said we'd be using a retort pouch. And what we had to do was develop something that would both sterilize, reheat, and then consume, that they could consume, and weighed no more than uh, a quarter pound per person per day for all their food. And what, uh, what we finally came up with, and something we'll show you a prototype, it's called ohmic heating. We built a package that had electrodes in it, and it uses almost 100% of the energy, converts it into heat. Uh, there, there's issues with the electrolysis, so we... We manage the electricity carefully, uh, but it's very efficient in converting and being able to sterilize products with less than 60 watts of energy. Now, if that looks much like an MRE that the military would use, you'd be right. That's uh, pretty much what that pouch looks like with some, with some electrodes added to it. And with that, the, the, we'll be able to put food in it, not use all the equipment we typically use on Earth, be able to sterilize, be able to reuse their, their packaging many times. Some heating simulations, we did those kind of things to make sure that we could uh, distribute the heat well through the food. Some idea of what uh, NASA thinks is going to look like on the mission to Mars, sitting on uh, uh, that planet. A Mars base station. 
Here, the project team, and, and including myself, there were people from Ohio State uh, and from uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center. And finally, I bring you a picture of tracks, tire marks on the surface of Mars. And so that, to me, was really informative to see those and really interesting to think about sometime in the future, just like that, that uh, exciting day in July, there would be a human footprint on the surface to Mars. Thank you.